Hey, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Building the Nantahala Retreat here in Western North Carolina. Today, we're going to finish the basement walls and frame the next floor. Hey, got good news. Yep. We got some power. Sweet. Yeah, man. Oh, well, I got bad news. I got zero tools that require power in my truck. <laughs> They're all battery. <laughs> we can use the power for one thing. Lunch. Hot lunch. Oh, I didn't we got a microwave. I didn't even bring lunch. <laughs> were you heating that up? He was solar powered. Yeah. You were solar either. powering your lunch under yeah. this black plastic. I didn't know we had power at first. What a camper guy you are, Boy Scout, bearded yeah, magician. <laughs> <laughs> yes to all those yeah. <laughs> One thing that had been bugging me all weekend was thinking about moving this door location like I mentioned in the last video. And we're doing this to accommodate a couch against the wall that would give a better viewing area for the TV location. I want to say I'm always paying attention to things while we're building it because even though I drew the plan, it doesn't mean there's not room for improvement or things that need to be changed. So I'm always keeping my eyes peeled throughout the project to make the plan better. Sure. I'll get a knife at some point yeah. in this job. Thanks. <laughs> With that done, I started marking the layout for the rest of the walls on this basement slab. This little section here was another change, actually. The homeowner wanted to add a wet bar. We decided to recess it into the mechanical room so it didn't eat into the space of the family room. This wall will be offset by 27 inches from the main load-bearing wall, but I want to keep the same layout. One easy way to do that is to just lay the plate in line with the other plate and hook on one of the studs that's on layout to continue that layout even though the walls are offset. Since I hooked my tape on the stud before, I set the studs ahead on my layout. You need my glasses? Oh, I see it. It's way down there. You need some glasses, bud? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. I've got glasses. No, <laughs> prescription eyewear. Okay. All right, what I'm doing is, is getting a reference for how long these studs need to be. So okay. I'm gonna pull down from the top wall yeah. to the laser plane, goes across this whole thing. And I'm gonna pull up from the various locations in the slab, uh, and those will be slightly different numbers. I'll add those two numbers together at every location. We'll give you a, hopefully the same, but probably slightly different number for the stud. Uh, and that's what you cut the studs. It's a different way to do it than with the chalk line. Genius. Sure. Five and a half is the up. Add those together. That'll be our stud minus the plates. Piece of cake. Genius. In case you missed the explanation on the last video, the reason we're measuring these studs individually and cutting them slightly different is because the slab is not perfectly, perfectly flat. It goes up and down just a little bit. So we cut the studs so the top of our wall plate is flat. This is just another way of doing it from the last episode where we used a string line to mark the studs. Arlo was just telling me a good story here. We went to tear these studs down, or this wall out, and uh, they had like crippled all these studs together, you know, to make a 16 foot high, it was really high ceiling. But, but it was crippled together like- Like that. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> Which, um, so it wasn't, wasn't, would... <laughs> wasn't really structurally very sound. I've never heard of that either. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, that's uh, that's one way to do it right there. And we were, actually, we figured it out because we were, like, looking to nail something, and it was like the stud was it here, moving. and it was, like, four <laughs> inches over over there, and we're going, how can this be? That is amazing. <laughs> This section of interior wall is two by six so that it can accommodate a three inch drain line in the wall without affecting the finishes. With all the basement walls framed, it was time to do what I think is one of the most important and probably most overlooked things you can do for a good quality home. And that's to straighten all the top plates and brace everything plumb and lock it in before you build the floor system on top of the walls. I use a combination of techniques to do this actually, using a level is one, using a string line is another, and using laser eye is the third, and that's the technique of sighting down a wall to see if it's bowed one way or the other, and this actually works pretty well. I usually try to put bracing on window or door frames so it's not in the way of sheathing later, and I also like to use these T25 deck screws so we can pull the bracing off later pretty easily. In a lot of cases here, we're just making minor adjustments to these wall plates to brace them, but in the big picture, the finished home, this will make a huge difference in how easy it is to trim out, put the flooring in, and other things like that because everything is square and straight.
Oh, okay. Yeah, that doesn't look good. How's your uh, solar charger doing today, bub? Is it working? It's doing well. Pretty good. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the sun's shining, right? And after waiting out this rainstorm for an hour and a half in the truck, we were able to get back at it and start the double top plate process. The last step in straightening the wall plates is to make sure there was no humps up or down. And in spite of all of the effort we took to make sure the wall plates were perfectly flat by cutting all the studs different lengths using two different techniques, there were still some slight humps up and down that needed some planing. If you look closely, I'm setting all of the nails with a punch before I run the planer here, and that's so that I don't destroy the planer blades immediately. And this was my first chance to try our new cordless DeWalt power planer that DeWalt sent us. And I wanna say that out of all of the cordless power tools I own, this was one of the best ones to go cordless on. As we're installing these double top plates, we're making sure to lap the joints opposite of the first top plate. And we're also making sure we lap over any joints in the other top plate by a minimum of two feet. This will make everything stronger. Doing the double top plate also allows the top of the wall to be load bearing in any location with a 16 inch stud spacing, which is great. And I know I've mentioned this before, but I also try to nail the double top plate with the nails just offset of the nails into the stud below. Here's a great trick I learned from somebody uh, to get these plates aligned. If it's way out here and you can't reach it with two hands really, you can do a side shot like a toenail and it'll usually pull the top plate over in line. I'm see if I can do it for a shot here. Yep, so you can see that flushed it up and now I can nail the top. Hey man, that double dumper is still uh, coming in handy. Look at that. Look at it, man. Trash dumper. Love it. Dude, I'm never using a single <laughs> wheel barrow ever again. Never I, again. I don't know if that'll last you a lifetime or not. Probably not. Our final step here before installing the floor joists is to mark layout for all the floor joists on all of the double top plates. This home is 26 feet wide and we have a three and a half inch wall down the center, splitting the span to less than 13 feet. I ordered 14 foot long floor joists. You can't order 13 foot long. And in order to increase the bearing of the floor joists across that small three and a half inch wall in the middle, we're just gonna leave these floor joists at full length, 14 feet, and we'll lap them and nail them together, creating a stronger floor structure. You might be asking, how does that affect the layout? And it does affect it. We basically mark dead center on the 16 centers, and we put one of these floor joists on each side of center as we lap them. For installing the rim joist, I like to use a positive stop, which is just this scrap of wood nailed to the mud sill, and that allows me to easily flush the rim joist with the edge of the mud sill. Generally speaking, using yellow pine floor joists is a less expensive alternative than ordering an engineered trust floor system, but these days with lumber prices what they are, I'm not really sure that that's the case. This pile of 2x12 yellow pine was about $3,200 for this one floor system. You're off the clock if you get injured. Now to get down with this in my hand. <laughs> Thought you were a hiker. I am. Thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> and OC. The next morning we were back to finish framing this floor system and we needed to do a girder over the bump out we had done for the wet bar down below because it took out a section of our load bearing wall. And instead of using joist hangers like usual, we decided to use a ledger board, which is a two inch strip of two by nailed to the bottom to support the weight of the joists here. 
Doing the girder in the depth of the floor system like this will allow us to not have a dropped header into this space with the wet bar, but it could interfere with some mechanical stuff that has to run in the depth of the floor system is the only negative. These floor joists are a natural material and that means they're not perfect. They all have some sort of character to them. So it's super important when you're building a floor to crown all of the floor joists in the same direction. In this case, we're crowning all of them up so that if there's any deflection in the floor, it'll actually straighten the joist. If you skip this step when you're building a floor, your floor will not be good. I just figured out the best way to freak everybody out. Just look at something and go, hmm. <laughs> at that point, everybody's like, what, 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 what is it? Oh, seriously? <laughs> All right. So what I did was um, I drew a mark where the toilet drain's gonna be out here, uh, and I nailed the joist right on it instead of you know where it's supposed to go. So. That's what happens sometimes when you're a construction guy. Hmm. Let me get a little gappage going there. There, there you go. go. I got a pointy face. Oh, gosh. There we go. Show you guys how not to do stuff sometimes. <laughs> This section of floor has some doubled up floor joists and the reason is it's directly below where the island will be in the kitchen, which usually has a bunch of people standing around it and also has a heavy piece of granite sitting on it. I had these washers in my truck <laughs> and I was thinking that if we use the washers on the end of the screws, it'll hold the screw from sucking in and we could probably suck this together. Man, I'm starting to think like Arlo. That sounds exactly what like Arlo <laughs> just said right before you said that. <laughs> Here's a great idea. Uh, screw that together and then you can take that one out and save the washers. Dude, that's a phenomenal idea, bro. Clamps just got a lot smaller. After installing all of the joists, we go back and add sheetrock nailers to any of the wall tops that don't have a joist just off to the side of them. And that will give a place, as you guessed, for the sheetrock to attach on the ceiling in these rooms below. And that finally brings us to the last step of framing this floor system, which is to install the rim board or band board. I like to make sure to plumb each of the joists before they're nailed to the band board so that nothing is tipping over and everything stays on layout for our subfloor. And again, I always like to use the power plane on top of the rim board to knock off any high spots and fine tune it because our next floor wall will sit directly on this rim board and it needs to be perfectly flat. A great pro tip here is to actually set aside some of your best floor joists to use as the band boards and it'll make this job of putting the bands on much easier. We've got our floor joists pretty much installed, you can see here. And I've seen a lot of these woodworkers take a Stabila six foot level like this, okay? and then slide it across the top of the floor joist, okay? To see how far it'll go. And that's a good judge of how flat your floor joists are in relation to one another. Like if there's one that's humped up, it'll stop it, right? Yeah. I've never done it, never we, tried we've it. We've never done this first time. We and we have, not, we have not tested it either on no. this floor. So I just thought we'd do it and just be cool like everybody else. <laughs> <This ain't gonna laughs> <work. laughs> Jones, you have no faith, brother. Try not to tip it Wait, over. Let's see what's happening here. How old is it going to be? Uh, that ain't bad. It wasn't bad. It, was it hit one, one, one humpy. Yeah. Can you say humpy? Can't say humpy. For sure. <laughs> Hey, thanks so much for building with us today. If you've enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a comment and a thumbs up. That helps YouTube know that we're making good content that they should recommend to other people. I appreciate it. I thought the day was over and then I, I looked down and I had like nine pounds of pressure in my tire.
and a huge cut. Yeah. Ray, you helped me out. He followed me in here. We got it aired up, plugged it. Oh yeah. High five. Now we can go home. Now we can go home. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully.